God, we thank you. We thank you for your blood. We thank you that the hope that we have is found in you and in you alone and what you have accomplished for us. Lord, as we come now to your word, I pray that you would help us to see what we must about you, about your greatness, about your love, that we would be truly impressed by who you are. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Well, please turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. We're going to be in the first three verses of 1 John chapter 3 this morning. In 1922, an archaeologist by the name of Howard Carter was completing a nearly 15-year expedition of digging in the famous Valley of the Kings in Egypt. He was hoping to find the royal tomb of Pharaoh Tutankhamun. Having found nothing after many months and years of searching, his days of digging were coming to an end. Funding for the expedition was running out. And then workers discovered 16 steps leading into the ground. In the hope that the find might prove significant, thousands of baskets were filled with rocks and sand, were carried away, and at the base of the steps, a door was found at the end of a long passageway. Carter gouged a small hole inside of the door and inserted a candle into the hole and peered in. Can you imagine what he must have been feeling? Fifteen years of digging and searching and looking and all of a sudden, just when it seemed like everything was over and done, the anticipation. His eyes grew accustomed to the light Details emerged into his view, and he saw strange animals, statues, and everywhere reflecting the light of the flickering candle was the glint of gold. He wrote, for a moment, I was struck dumb with amazement. A colleague asked, can you see anything? Carter's reply was, yes. Wonderful things. This morning, we're going to peer into something far more impressive, far more captivating, of far more value than all the treasure of the world. We're going to peer into the love of the Father for us. We're going to see, we're going to behold something far more consequential far more impacting on one's life than any archaeological find. We're going to find a treasure in God's love that has a bearing on eternity. Any treasure that you would find on this earth only impacts but a few years. Let's read together 1 John 3, 1 through 3. John says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. That we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Our passage this morning begins with the word see. This is to behold, to consider. There's a sense of wonder, of awe. It it communicates a, a sense of amazement at what is about to follow. What John is about to say is something we are to contemplate that it would sink down into our being. And he says, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. If you are in Christ, 
If you are in Christ, if you are a believer, there is a reality that you are to see, you are to consider. And it is how great a love the Father has bestowed upon you. John says how great. The ESV says what kind. And this word in the original is somewhat difficult to capture in the English. But it implies a reaction of amazement or being impressed by. The early usage of the word was at times used to communicate that something is from another country. It's foreign. There's a uniqueness. This word really sets apart the love of God as a, a foreign love a unique love, a love from another realm. And John says, see or consider this amazing, captivating love the Father has bestowed on us. Something has captured John's attention and he's telling his readers to behold it as well. The great love of God has been bestowed upon you. His love has been given as a permanent gift. He gave it. He bestowed it upon us. It was not earned. It was not merited. He did not owe it to us. He freely gave it. He freely gives it. And if you have placed your faith in Jesus as the only means and way of salvation, if you have recognized that you are a sinner who sinned against a holy God, a perfect and holy God and that your sin deserves punishment and that Jesus took that punishment and in light of this, you have repented of a life lived for yourself and in faith and repentance have turned to live for God. There is something you must see this morning. There is a, a truth that you must behold. And really the point is is seeing unto considering, unto a consideration. You must contemplate this reality. You must consider it. And that is the call this morning. Consider the Father's great love. Consider the Father's great love. The Father has loved you with an inexhaustible, majestic, perfect love. And we must give consideration to that love this morning. John's going to help us by unfolding some of the realities of this great love that we would take time to contemplate this love, that it, it would sink down into our hearts and our minds. So this morning, consider the Father's great love. Number one, it makes us God's child, separating us from the world. Consider the Father's great love. It makes us God's child, separating us from the world. From the world. Look again at verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. What has that love done? What do we see when we peer into the love of God? That we would be called children of God. And such we are for this reason. The world does not know us because it did not know Him. The Father's great love has made us His children. He has made us children of God, and for this reason, the world does not know us. And as we consider the Father's great love that has been given to us, we see it manifested in the reality that we would be called children of God. God has done far more than a declaration of love for us. God has made us his child. He's made us his children. John says that we would be called children of God. This love of God should captivate our attention and an expression of God's love for us is that we would now be called, we would be declared children of God. Does that capture your attention? And John says we are called children of God and such we are. This is a done deal. It's a sealed reality. The emphasis that we are not only God's children in name, but in reality also is true. God in his love has brought us into his household. He has adopted us as sons and daughters. This is factual. And this, to be called children of God, is effectual, indicating that God himself acted. God did this to declare our status as members of his family, to bring us into his household. If there is anything in you, if there's anything in you that wants to make you an initiating agent in this, 
That is that you were lovable, that you were worth it, that you were good enough, that you caught God's attention because something in you was desirable. You need to pause in your tracks. God did this unprompted by anything in us. We were enemies. We were at enmity with God. Romans 5 tells us God demonstrated his love for us when we were godless, helpless sinners. We didn't meet God halfway. He rescued us. He took us from being dead in our trespasses and sins and made us alive together with Christ. And it truly is astonishing that one who is so holy would love those who are unholy. And yet God acted God did this. What we must see is the greatness of God demonstrated in his great love. That's what the love of God puts on display is his greatness. This reality brings us great benefit, but not because this reality is a cause for us to look to us prior to God's love in order to feel good about things, but rather because it causes us to look away from ourselves apart from God and to see him in his majesty, in his greatness, in his love, in his forgiveness, in his purity, in his infinite worth. And then we are to see who we are in him. One's no longer known by the world, no longer enslaved to sin, no longer hopeless, no longer under condemnation, no longer separated from God. We are now his children. He has not only saved us from our sins, but he has adopted us into his family. He loves us. He cares for us like a loving father. He takes care of every real need we ever have. He took care of our greatest need in making a way for the forgiveness of sins by not sparing his own son. This love of the father is a matchless love. And as his child, he will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He's bestowed his love as a permanent gift it is a gift that will not, will not, cannot be withdrawn. Turn to Romans 8 for just a moment. Romans 8. God protects you. He provides for you. He gives you everything and nothing can separate you from his great love. This is a permanent love. It's a fixed love. It's an unshakable love. In Romans 8, we see that. Look at verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Verse 38, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, our Lord. You can turn back to 1 John. For our hearts this morning, not figuring out outlets for your children's energy during social distancing can separate you from the love of God. Not difficulties of finding household items can separate you from the love of God. Not the cancellation of sports activities, hobbies, not the cancellation of family trips and celebrations can separate you from God's love, not disappointments, not depletion of retirement funds, not loss of income, not loss of job, not uncertainty of tomorrow, not pandemics, not cancer, not the loss of a loved one 
Nothing. Nothing can separate you from the love of the Father. And not only that, but whatever hardship or difficulty you may find yourself in right now, you can face it knowing that you are loved as a child of God. And it is impossible, it is impossible to be loved any more, any more perfectly by God than you are loved right now in Christ. You are loved by the one who has infinite wisdom. That is he, God, always chooses the best goals and the best means to accomplish those goals. God's decisions will always bring about the best results and they will bring about those results through the best possible means. And he is omnipotent. That is, that is he is powerful, all powerful. Not only does he have the best goals and the best means to bring about those goals, but he has more than enough power to be able to do anything within his divine nature, accomplishing completely his perfect plan. One pastor has said it this way, you, Christian, are loved by the one who matters most. Whatever this world brings before you, you can face it knowing you face it under the Father's love as his child. We, this morning, are peering into wonderful things. Wonderful things. John then says, for this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. In verse one, do you see that there? You see, God's love has made us his child. God's love gives to us a close to, closeness to him, but this also for us brings a separation from the world. John says, for this reason, that is because we are children of God, the world does not know us. The world is all those who are not in Christ, unbelievers. They do not know us. Well, in what way does the world not know us? I know lots of unbelievers. They know me. The world doesn't understand what we're all about. The concept of the gospel is foolishness to the world. Thus, the world doesn't understand our values. The world doesn't understand our priorities, our pursuits, our beliefs. The world can't figure those things out. They don't understand those things. They don't know those things. We're an unsolvable puzzle. We're a conundrum to the world. Everything about us is to be radically different. We're separated from the world. The world does not know us because it did not know him. And you are in him now. The world failed to understand God's supreme revelation of himself in his son. The world despised him. The world rejected him. The, the world forsook him. The world handed him over to be crucified. The world preferred a murderer over him. It rejected him, it crucified him, and we should not be confused when the world rejects you, when they can't figure you out. When you're the punchline of the joke, when you get the awkward looks at the social gathering, you will, for Christ, undoubtedly feel like an outcast. In fact, you should be shocked and concerned if you fit flawlessly into this world. The Christian's life should be an enigma to the world. They don't understand. They don't understand why we don't repay evil for evil, why we don't take revenge. They don't understand why we bless those who curse us, why we rejoice in trials, why we say no to jobs that conflict with Sunday mornings, why we request Wednesday nights off so we can be with our small group, why we would send people or why people would go to Papua New Guinea, why we give sacrificially to the church our hard-earned money, why we say no to promotions that takes us away from our families, why we stay in our marriages when it's hard, why we maintain purity prior to marriage, why we are content when we have little, why we have hope when we receive hard news, why we don't grumble and complain when we have cause. 
why we read a book that is 2,000 years old each day, why we sit and listen to someone ramble on from a book every week. The world doesn't know us. Why would they? They did not know him. They did not know Jesus. They don't know God. This is a tragic statement for the world. The world is proud of its knowledge, but the real thing worth knowing it does not know. The real one worth knowing they do not know. The world needs what you need and what I need. The world needs Jesus. And before we get offended by the world, before we get put off by the world's distaste for us, we should have compassion for the world and we should proclaim boldly Jesus to the world. Praise God, someone shared Jesus with us. Consider the Father's great love. It makes us God's child, separating us from the world. That was number one. Number two, consider the Father's great love. It guarantees us conformity to Christ, giving us a hope leading to purity. It guarantees us conformity to Christ, giving us a hope leading to purity. There's a lot there. Look at verse two. Beloved, now, we are children of God. John reiterates that glorious reality. Then he says, it, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. That's the conformity to Christ that is for all who are in him. We have a great hope of conformity to Christ. And then verse three, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. This hope of conformity to Christ is to lead to a purifying of self. The Father's great love guarantees us conformity to Christ, giving us a hope leading to purity. John begins verse 2 saying, beloved, and this is a term of endearment. And then he says, now we are children of God. We, we are his now, and in saying this, he's setting up a contrast. Now we are his children, yet we do not know all that we will be. John is saying we don't know everything about heaven and what eternity will be like, all that will entail for us, but there is something we do know. Do you see that in verse two? It has not appeared what we will be, but there is something we do know. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. We will be conformed to his likeness. Now, first of all, Jesus is going to appear. We have to just stop there for a moment. Jesus is returning. He, he's coming. We don't know when he's coming, but he is coming and his return has never been nearer than it is at this very moment. He will appear and what a wonderful thought. And and not only that, but when he appears, we will be like him. <sighs> In what way will we be like him? Well, to be like him implies spiritual unity, not complete identity. Spiritual unity, not complete identity. There is only one Jesus. We will not equal Jesus. He is infinite but we will be similar to him in holiness and resurrection bodies. We will sin no longer. Jesus will come in his glorified body, and when that happens, we will receive our glorified bodies as, as we as redeemed human beings will be fully transformed, conformed into his image, into his likeness. Supremely loving him and imitating him in purity perfectly. Have you ever sinned? Have you ever sinned and just thought, why? Why? Why did I sin again? Oh. You said something or did something hurtful. 
you knew it was sinful and you just thought, why? Stop. You responded poorly again to a circumstance. You, you snapped at your spouse. You spoke harshly to your child. Maybe you returned back to a sin that you have been fighting. And you just feel sick to your stomach. Why? He's coming. He is coming. And when he comes, you will see him. And in a moment, you will be like him. You will sin no more. All because of the love the father has bestowed on us in Jesus Christ, we have a hope our gross sin that deserves eternal punishment that Jesus bore, that we heard about this morning, that Jesus bore on our behalf, that we still, although not enslaved to those sins, we still commit sins, will all at once be done away with forever. Forever never to sin again, never to offend a holy God, to please him, to glorify him perfectly for all eternity in his majestic presence. No more guilt. No thought of shrinking away from him in shame, never wishing we could, we could just take back that word. Never wishing again that we could undo that deed. Oh, for that day when we will see him and we are like him. I don't think we can long for that day too much or contemplate that day too often. And then there's a clause that could easily be thrown away or missed. We can't miss it because we will see him just as he is. Look at the end of verse two. Because we will see him just as he is. John in Revelation chapter one describes the son of man. He says, the son of man is clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Jesus unveiled in all his glory and all his splendor is coming for his own. There won't be anything about his greatness. There won't be anything about the greatness of Jesus that will be hidden from us at that time that we won't have eyes to see. We will see him just as he is. For the believer, this is a wonderful thought of hope and excitement and anticipation. And for those who are not in Christ, it is terrifying. Terrifying. He will come to get his own. He will come to bring judgment on those who are not. And then there's an outflow of this reality. Look again at verse three. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who has this hope. This is referring to what John just said, the hope of Jesus' return. The hope of conformity to Christ's likeness. Everyone who has this hope fixed on Jesus purifies himself. The hope of Christ's return has 
has enormous significance on how the believer lives his or her life today. It must. It must. When our hope is fixed on the return of Christ, where we will be able to enjoy him without sin, it produces a growing desire to be like Jesus now. John says the believer purifies himself. We know that it is the spirit of God working in the believer that produces fruit and godliness, but the believer by the grace of God desires to pursue obedience. And, and, and this one takes very real steps, very real measures to put off sinfulness and to put on what is right. Right? The believer, the child of God, desires to grow in their sanctification. That is to be conformed more and more and more into Christ's likeness, to be made more and more holy over time. The child of God desires this growth, this sanctification, and the imminence of our glorification should hasten our sanctification. The imminence of our glorification should hasten our sanctification. The promise of our being conformed to Christ's likeness should fuel our pursuit of holiness now. Have you or your family, you've, you've decided to go on vacation somewhere. Let's say you, you know a trip is coming. You're going to go to Hawaii. You're planning on going to Hawaii. You're excited about this trip. And then all of a sudden, dad starts wearing khaki shorts and Tommy Bahama shirts. Every time you enter the room, he calls out aloha. You're not in Hawaii, but it's coming. And in anticipation, we're going to embrace here all the things that we can of what it will be like when we get to that destination. So it should be in our anticipation of Jesus' return, of the nearness to Jesus and the conformity into his likeness. It must drive us to embrace purity now. Heaven is coming. Glorification is coming. Do everything you can to pursue what it will be like on that day when you will sin no more. And so you put off the deeds of the flesh and you pursue the fruit of the spirit you say no to sin you look to be righteous to be pure in all of life's various circumstances that come your way consider paul's heart pertaining to this turn to philippians philippians chapter 3 paul felt this Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. Paul says, But whatever things were gained to me, that's things of the world, things that he would have looked upon, that he would have stood upon, that he would have pursued in this world or thought gave him value in this world, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that. Why does he do all of those things? Why does he count all those things as lost? Why does he not cling to the treasures of this earth so that he might cling to Christ? That I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. He's longing for that day when he will be glorified when he will be resurrected, when he sees Christ and is like him. He's longing for that day and all of the treasures of this world, all of the accolades of this world, all of the progress that he could make in this world, counts them but loss, rubbish. All he wants is Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. He is seeking to grow to be honoring to the Lord, to be pleasing to the Lord in all things. Back in 1 John. John says we purify ourselves and in light of the coming return of Jesus, we must actively seek to be holy, to be pure. 
And so we, we purify our eyes and we purify our minds and we purify our hearts and our words and where we go and what we do. We should give thought to purity. Young men and women, in your dating, you should think, give consideration and pursue that which is most pure. In your entertainment, men and women, what is most pure? What helps me be pure in what we watch or what we listen to? What helps me be most pure? What apps do you have on your phone? What websites do you visit on your device? What friends do you associate with? Out of love for God in response to his great love, in anticipation of the imminent return of Jesus, where we will see him and we will be like him, we purify ourselves. Does this sound burdensome to you or exciting? Does the thought of, of purifying yourself sound exciting or burdensome? If doing what is most right is a burden, you aren't going to enjoy heaven very much. If you think holiness is a burden, you aren't prepared for heaven. If you think purity is lacking somehow, you, you are going to be disappointed when you see Jesus. There's absolutely no good thing lacking for those who by the spirit of God, in the grace of God, with a love for God, vigorously and intentionally pursue purity before God. There's nothing lacking, only good. And we have much to rejoice in because we know that even in our inadequacies, in our wrong thinking, there is grace for those who are in Christ. That's the hope that we have, that even though we may not respond correctly to this call today, if you are in Christ, one day there will be a time when every call that is placed on your life, you will respond to perfectly. And praise God for that. John knew of the importance and even the sanctifying effect of awaiting Jesus' return. He spoke to this in chapter 2. Look just a few verses before our section, a couple in verse 28 of chapter 2. He says, Now little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. He is coming and conduct yourself today in a manner so that when he returns, you won't shrink back in shame. Abide in him so that we don't shrink away from him at his return. This last week, was there moments where if Jesus would have returned in that moment, you would have been ashamed? Repent of those and press on this week. Give consideration, give thought as you purify yourself. If Jesus returned in this moment, would I be ashamed? Would I, would I be an ashamed workman, an ashamed steward on behalf of my Savior if he were to return this very moment? The love of the Father is truly astonishing that it would bring so much good to our eternity, that it has such significant ramifications on our present. I just have to ask, as you're watching, as you're listening this morning, have you experienced the love of the Father? Have you experienced this love? It is before you this morning. It is offered as a, as a free gift. And I would plead with you, if you have not experienced this love, repent. 
become a child of God by the grace of God alone through faith in him. Repent and turn to Christ as your only hope, as the great hope, the supreme hope. Turn to him. And I would ask you if, if, if you would do that, if you would do that, email the elders. We'd love to talk with you about that. If you're curious more about how to know the love of the Father, email the elders. Don't wait. Do it this morning. Do it now. Email us. We would love. There's nothing more we would love to talk with you about than the love of the Father. Please do that. Please do that. There's a glorious hope in Jesus because of the love of the Father that aids us in whatever trials, whatever struggles, whatever difficulties are around us, or especially the more serious difficulties, the the sin that is in us helps us, aids us, so that we can be pleasing in responsive love to an initiating father. Let's pray. God, thank you for your great love. Thank you for the hope that we have. Thank you that we can trust you, that we find strength in you, that we find comfort in you. Lord, I pray that we would truly see and truly consider what we have uh, looked at this morning in your word, that we would embrace it, that we would find comfort in it, that we would find hope in it, that we would find motivation to press on yet another day, fighting sin, pursuing purity. We ask for your name's sake. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.